as we get close, so we'll, you know, there, there's probabilities for what's going to happen in September will be more and more locked in. Um, and then when the when the you know the event happens, if it's if it's what they expected, I wouldn't expect particularly you know explosive uh, you know asset price changes that week or that day. Um, but if something deviates significantly from what they expected, we could see you know if they cut more than expected, we'd probably see a bigger jump in gold, potentially Bitcoin, than than what was priced in. It's money with a finite supply. Um, you know, there's some disadvantages relative to gold that it's you know it's got a shorter track record. Uh, it's just it's a different type of money, but it's got some advantages, which is that it's globally portable, uh, much easier than gold. Um, it's got a lower supply inflation rate than gold, uh, and it's I would say it's still below its its total adjustable market. So it's still held by you know very kind of a, a small percentage of people in any meaningful capacity. Where do you see Bitcoin then? in the next 12 months. So I, I, I think that market consensus is pretty accurate. Uh, my base case would be 25 basis points, wouldn't be shocked by 50 basis points. And what the Fed tends to do is they tend to um, send speakers out uh, with statements that kind of shift the market's perception that, you know, if the market was over expecting 50 basis points, while the Fed was expecting probably 25 basis points, they'd probably start sending out some slightly hawkish speakers and vice versa. If the market wasn't expecting 50 um, and they were intended to do 50, they probably would start sending out more dovish speakers. Lynn Alden, a highly respected financial analyst and founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, is renowned for her sharp analysis across equities, macroeconomics, and especially Bitcoin. In this engaging interview with Kitco's Michelle McCory, Lynn shares why she's bullish on Bitcoin and dissects the much-anticipated Fed rate cut. She explains that the impact on the equity and crypto markets hinges on whether the Fed adopts a hawkish or dovish stance. While the CME Fed Watch tool signals a 100% chance of a rate cut, the debate rages on whether it will be a 25 or 50 basis point cut. Lynn provides clarity on this controversy and offers valuable insights for investors. Stick around until the end, where Lynn reveals her Bitcoin strategy and why she's holding firm. As you dive deeper into Lynn Alden's analysis, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more insights like this. Join the conversation by sharing your thoughts and observations in the comments below. Every interaction helps with the YouTube algorithm and supports the growth of our channel. Thank you and enjoy the video. So in the, you know, for these near term cuts, I would expect, you know, that the market pricing is fairly accurate. I think we're going to see a, a mild set of cuts coming up. One of the things I did in the book Broken Money was I was very critical of central banking in general. So they basically, they, you know, when the economy is going strong, they start to raise interest rates until they kind of pressure it. And then when it starts to blow up, they cut interest rates and they try to re reinflate the next credit cycle. So they're, they're kind of, in theory, supposed to be a counter cyclical force, but in practice, they end up being a lagging pro cyclical force. They, they, they contribute to booms happening and then they're unsustainable. And then they, they contribute to popping the booms that they themselves caused. And then they try to reflate the bust that came from the, the boom that they broke, right? So it's, it's yeah. just kind of this like this repeated cycle of putting out fires that they themselves at least partially started. Um, so yeah, I, I'm fully critical in that sense. Um, and as far as, as how assets should react, I mean, basically, they tend to react in a, in a delta to what happened versus what is expected. So if the market is, is you know, but as we get close, so we'll, you know, there, there's probabilities for what's going to happen in September will be more and more locked in. Um, and then when the, when the, you know, the event happens, if it's, if it's what they expected, I wouldn't expect particularly, you know, explosive, uh, you know, asset price changes that week or that day. Um, but if something deviates significantly from what they expected, we could see, you know, if they cut more than expected, we'd probably see a bigger jump in gold, potentially Bitcoin, than, than what was priced in. Um, so, I, you know, I don't specialize in these kind of multi-week or multi-month trading ranges. Right. Um, I'm structurally bullish on gold and Bitcoin. Um, and then when it comes to equities, it, it really depends on what sector, what, what jurisdiction of equities, what valuation so there's, there's some types of equities I'm quite bearish on. There's some types of equities I'm quite bullish on. Um, and I think we're, we're probably going to see rotations in the quarters ahead. Um, but I wouldn't read too much into any one rate cut period. So what are you expecting in terms of a continued rate cycle? Do you so see? I, yeah, Go so I, I think, 
yeah, basically, I would expect a a kind of a gradual rate cut path, unless or until we get some sort of credit event. If a credit event does not materialize of of significant scale to start breaking the market in some way or get an unemployment to spike above, say, 4.5%, you'd probably expect mild cuts. If you do start to get some of those events, we could start seeing 50 or 75 basis point cuts at a time. Uh, my general base case would be to see a higher low in interest rates. So for about 40 years, we saw you know lower highs and lower lows of interest rates, both short short end and long-term interest rates. Um, and this, this kind of post, post-pandemic hiking cycle broke that trend for the first time. We had a higher high in interest rates, both for the short end and the long end. Uh, and I think the thing we have to see next going forward, in my base case, is are we going to get a higher low in interest rates? So they, they could cut interest rates down to, you know, eventually 2 or 3% for the cycle, but it would still be above the zero that they held it for much of the, the prior decade. Um, and it, it should that be the case, I would generally expect that the cuts are not going to be as effective for large swaths of the economy as they normally are. And that's because generally when they had when they hit a lower low in interest rates, there's a lot of refining refinancing activity among existing mortgages. Um, okay. You know, everybody can basically, you know, you know, kind of refinance their mortgages and basically get a free lunch. They just kind of refinance and lock in a long-term lower rate. Um, and if we get a higher low in interest rates, then really the only uh, people that it makes sense for them to refinance are the ones that originated mortgages in the past two years or so. And that, that activity was very low because of how high the rates were. So there's not a lot of refinancing activity if we get a higher low in interest rates. Um, it would be beneficial for you know, small businesses around the margins um, that generally borrow at shorter durations from banks. Um, it could be potentially beneficial for some marginal you know, commercial real estate, marginal um, you know, banks that lend to commercial real estate. Um, there would be parts of the, of the more cyclical economy um, that would be you know, helped um, by those rate cuts. Um, but the, the largest part to the economy, kind of the, the homeowners and the investment grade corporations, um, a lot of that would be fairly unaffected. Um, so I think that we, we could be in some of a, a malaise uh, for, for several quarters, um, depending on other factors. And I think that basically the market is probably over indexing the importance of monetary policy, at least to the extent that we're in a few hundred basis points uh, here, you know, if they if they cut to zero tomorrow, then of course that would be a massive shock to the market. But right. within kind of their mandate and within this kind of you know base case of a high or low, I, I think they're they're fairly um, less less impactful than maybe, maybe most market participants think. I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the rates uh, cut stop anywhere between two and four percent. It depends what inflation does. It depends what energy does. Uh, it depends on what fiscal policies happen by next year, which which is partially dependent on election outcomes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I I don't try to predict um, a specific endpoint for where this happens. There's too many there's too many variables into that, other than to say that my base case would be a you know a higher low, which means I I'd be somewhat I'd be rather surprised if we got back to zero rates in the next cycle. Okay. I think we're probably going to be elevated compared to that. And therefore, you see a U.S. economy desensitized to interest rates at between two, three and a half percent. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I think we're entering an era of kind of sideways choppy interest rates. Um, and that's a problem because for 40 years, you know, we've had higher public debt to GDP, but we've had lower, structurally lower interest rates. And so interest expense on the public ledger has been very manageable. Um, you know, same to some extent for the private sector. Um, but as we start to go sideways in interest rates, if we, if we kind of vary between you know, two and six for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, while public, you know, deficits are still running at 6% of GDP outside of a recession, let alone what we would get in a recession. Um, public debt to GDP is still high and rising. Um, and so interest expense is actually a really serious matter now. Um, so they're, they're kind of constrained on how high they could raise interest rates, uh, especially while maintaining control of their own balance sheet. Uh, and, you know, basically the, the, the slower they are to cut rates, the sooner they might ha- have to go back to expanding their balance sheet because, um, you know, eventually there's so much bonds issued and they would run out of the reverse repo facility uh, and you get kind of a rejection by forward buyers. I-, I think probably by the end of next year, the Fed's also going to go back to balance sheet increases. 
uh, you know, maybe not at a very high pace, but at a, at a positive uh, uh, delta. And I think that's another, another variable that, um, you know, that, that'll be kind of next year's story. Where do you see Bitcoin then in the next 12 months? Uh, so generally speaking, in the next 12 to 18 months, I'm, I'm fairly bullish on it. Um, you know, I, generally speaking, the biggest correlation I found to Bitcoin price is global liquidity. Uh, and there's multiple ways to, to measure global liquidity. The, the one I tend to use is global broad money supply denominated in dollars. And so there's both a credit creation component uh, and a dollar index component to that liquidity measurement which is relevant because of how much dollar dominant debt exists uh, in the world. Um, and generally speaking, when that's when that's doing well over a given six month period, normally Bitcoin's doing well over a given six month period uh, and or 12 month period. And you know, there's, when that's doing poorly, uh, usually Bitcoin's not doing great either. Um, that, that can't really tell you what's gonna happen on a given week or even a given quarter, but over a 12 month period, if you have a high conviction on the direction of global liquidity, uh, generally speaking, Bitcoin is is a good way to express that, um, especially if you look at other Bitcoin specific indicators. So if you look at, for example, the market capitalization of Bitcoin relative to the realized capitalization of Bitcoin, which is another way of saying the on-chain cost basis of Bitcoin. So every coin uh, kind of uh, price at the last time it moved on chain in dollar terms. Um, you can look at the multiple between market cap and then the cost basis during those really big like bull market tops that, that generally have like a three-year correction after them. Usually you get a very high gap between market cap and realized cap. Um, so far, we've not really hit any of those extremes in this cycle. Um, in addition, whenever you have a really strong bull market, uh, you do generally get selling from longer term holders. You know, someone bought Bitcoin five years ago and they might be up 5x in their position. Uh, maybe they want to buy a house and start a family, or maybe they just want to uh, diversify to some extent. You know, maybe Bitcoin's now like 90% of their net worth and they want to, you know, trim it back down. You start, you start to see selling pressure from those longer term holders that are, that are significantly up in their, in their uh, price action. Um, and that kind of exhausts some of the the incoming demand eventually. That, that's kind of what contributes to the bull market's ending along with liquidity rolling over. And so far in this cycle, there's only been kind of a modest amount of that longer term selling. So I, I don't really consider that this cycle has hit any of the extremes uh, of prior cycles. And so the combination of, of being pretty positive on, on liquidity for call it the next 18 months and not really seeing too much excesses in the Bitcoin space currently, uh, my, my, my base case is is bullish on Bitcoin over the next 18 months. Hope you found Lynn's analysis on the Fed rate cut and her bullish take on Bitcoin insightful. What's your take on the upcoming Fed decision? Are we in for a 25 or 50 basis point cut? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Drop your comments and observations below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, share it with others, and subscribe to the channel for more great content. Thanks for watching.